Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you. Welcome to our Thursday broadcast. Uh, the title of the broadcast tonight is called The Full Armor of God. I've been asked by a number of people uh, over the last recent bit, and actually a couple of people a year or so ago, if I would talk about the full armor of God that we find written in Ephesians 6. So I thought tonight would be a good time to actually do that. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, we'll be looking at a passage in Ephesians chapter 6. If, you, if you're just making notes, we'll be looking at verses 10 through verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 6. The full armor of God. I hope to be able to give you an overview of what the armor is, why it's necessary, why we must have it on, and the importance of it, and, and just go over the different parts. There are six parts when it comes to the armor. Now, the image that we're seeing here is that of a warrior, that of a soldier, that of someone going to war. And the reason why is because we, we'll see this in the passage, we are in a spiritual war. Those of us who claim to be a child of God, who are true believers, we are at war against the forces of evil, against the forces of darkness. We're in a war. And because we're in a war, we need to be properly outfitted. If you were a soldier going into a battle, you'd be pretty crazy to go into it with no armor, with no protection, with no weapons at all. But God gives us the weapons that we need. And so having said all that, we are in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Now, I'm warning you now that there's a lot of references that we'll be looking at, particularly in Isaiah. So if you are making notes and you're going to be a good Berean, and I know you will be, you want to take down all these references and look them up after I give them to you. Uh, when you're doing your own personal Bible study to make sure that all of this is really fitting together. There's no way that I can expound on every single verse we're going to be looking at in just one broadcast. It would be just too much information. But you can certainly look that up for yourself. I'll give you some comment on it. So hopefully this will help you. So now we're in Ephesians 6 beginning in verse 10. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this, dar of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let's just stop right there. First of all, what I want you to see is that the Apostle Paul is telling us that we need to be strong and we need to have strength. But is that our own strength? No. He's saying in verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You see, when we're in the spiritual war, we cannot win that war. We cannot. We have to look at the bigger picture. This war is between Jesus and God and between Satan. It's a war that's happening in the heavenlies. It's a war that's happening right here on earth. It's a spiritual war. Now, a lot of it manifests, of course, in physical realities, but it is a spiritual war that we're fighting against, and that's what Paul is talking about here in verse 12. And so if we've got to be strong, we have to be strong in our own faith in the Lord and know that he is fighting the battles for us as we go forward. You can think of it this way. God is the general. And he's directing his troops against the forces of evil. And you and I, as true believers, are those forces that are coming against the forces, the world powers, the forces of evil, and all of those things that Satan is trying to upset. And it's not just in a political realm. That's only one aspect of it. It's a greater realm. It's a greater realm of spiritual battle. It's the battle for souls. It's the battle of where you're going to spend eternity. That's the real battle. And so, first of all, Paul is encouraging us in verse 10 to say, you need to be strong in the Lord and in the power or strength of his might. It's not ours. I can't win the battle, but I can win it with God on my side. Now, then he tells us instructions in verse 11. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to guard or stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And I want you to see that because in a little later, he's also going to tell us something else about this standing firm. Please notice that all the times he says firm, it means not backing down. You hear me say it all the time. In this ministry, from this pastor, this preacher, there's no backing down. There's no quit. There's no retreat. We don't turn around and run from 
insults or from people who are coming against us or people who don't like hearing what I'm saying. We don't turn and run. We stand our ground and we preach the gospel. And the, part of the reason I can do that is because I am carrying and I put on the full armor of God every single day because I am in a spiritual battle every day. And if you are being obedient to Christ and you're living a God-glorifying life with holiness and righteousness, you are in the same battle. You are being attacked every day, every minute of every day, whether it's advertising, whether it's television, radio, whatever. There's all kinds of things that are attacking us at all times. There, there's, there's twisted beliefs. There's wrong, there's wrong doctrines out there. There's a lot of political unrest. There's hatred between cultures. I mean, we're just being attacked all the time constantly and if we don't have our full armor on if we don't have these six elements in place we could easily fall victim and get caught up in the mess that the world is in but god has called us to battle against those forces and so the first thing that we're looking at here paul says put on the full armor of god so that you will be able to stand firm stand firm no retreat friends no retreat no backing up standing firm against the schemes of the devil and we all know that the devil has nothing but schemes we saw that all through the gospels how many times did the devil try to trip up jesus three times in the wilderness that we know about but how many times did he affect other people with sicknesses and so on how many times did he try to he, he went into judas didn't he and what happened to judas judas betrayed our lord the devil infiltrated him the devil will take any opportunity to infiltrate any of us he will do whatever he can to destroy us to destroy christianity and to take as many of us to hell with him that is his goal and so the only way to fortify ourselves against that is to put on the full armor of god not just part of it not just the pieces we like the full armor of god because as he says here in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, our war, this struggle that we have is not against flesh and blood. It's not against you personally or me personally. What is it against? He lists a bunch of them here. It's against rulers, against power, against the world forces of the darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. It's a spiritual battle that sometimes comes out and permeates in physical violence. Do you ever feel at the end of a day, and I can tell you this happens very often, particularly in the last couple of weeks. It doesn't seem to matter how much rest I get, and I don't always get great rest. But you ever feel like maybe you've been run over by a truck, that no matter how well you're eating, and you're exercising, and you're getting sleep, and you, you're, you're, take, you're trying to take care of your body and your mind, it still feels like a truck just ran over you. You ever feel that way? You just feel overwhelmed. And I, I know what that is when I start feeling that way. It's not that I'm feeling under the weather. It's not that I'm coming down with a cold. It's not that I'm eating the wrong food or I'm not exercising enough. It's a spiritual war. I've been under attack the last couple of weeks, particularly on social media. It's a spiritual battle. I will often say to my beloved wife, I'll say, you know, honey, I just feel worn out. I'm tired today. And it's only because I'm in a spiritual war. We've got to carry our armor as we're in battle against Satan because we are wrestling against darkness and powers and rulers and all of the evil that's in this world. We are trying to live a God glorifying life for Jesus Christ. We are trying to share the gospel. We are trying to be faithful Christians to his church that he established and very often we're under attack and so if you're ever feeling that way just check your spiritual senses maybe you're under spiritual attack now there's some people that don't believe of spiritual attack or demon possession but it's in the bible and if it's in the bible it's true so you may be at this very moment under spiritual attack it may not be anything more than the devil is trying to get you. He's trying to trip you up. He's trying to get you to say something you shouldn't or do something you shouldn't do. But when we have the full armor, we're going to be just fine against that. Let's start getting into the armor, shall we? Verse 13 says, therefore, take up the full armor of God. That's the second time Paul said that. He said it back in verse 11, and he's repeating it in verse 13. Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. 
and having done everything to stand firm. You notice how Paul keeps using the same words. He's talking about taking up the full armor of God. He's talking about standing firm. And he's talking about resisting the evil day or resisting the schemes of the devil. James 4, 7 tells us this. You probably know this one by heart. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He's talking about resisting the devil. See, the devil, if we resist him, he's going to go find someone else to antagonize. He's going to go find someone else to bother. He's going to go find someone else to try to take the hell with him if we resist him. But if we leave that door open even just a little bit, Satan can come right in because the Bible calls him that he is a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Satan is out to destroy your soul. He's out to destroy you, and he's out to take you to hell with him. I can't stress that enough. You may not hear this out of every preacher or every pastor, but that's what Satan's goal is. He only has one goal. See, Satan already knows he's defeated, and he already knows when Christ comes back again and he is bound into that pit for a thousand years. Satan's future is in hell forevermore with all of his minions, all of his cohorts, all of those angels that left heaven with him, and every single person who has left this world without Jesus being their Lord and Savior. Every person, no exceptions. And so while he's still roaming to and fro on the earth, while he still all has all of this power over the darkness of this world, he's gathering souls every day. He's gathering souls. And he's just gathering more and more. And when that person dies or if a person dies and they don't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that's it. There is no second chance. Their chance is now. Their chance is here on this side of the grave while there's still a breath in the body. I can't stress that enough. Let's get into this here. Verse 13, he says, take the full armor of God. We've seen that twice. So that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. You see that? Stand firm, friends. No retreat, no backtrack. Okay, now he's going to get into the actual parts of what a soldier would be wearing at that time, a Roman soldier, going into battle. Here, third time, verse 14, he says, stand firm, therefore. See? Stand firm. Don't back up. No retreat. Don't quit. You're on the front line. I'm on the front line every day of my life. You should be on the front line. Do not back up. Stand firm. We resist the devil. He's going to go somewhere else. But while we're standing firm, we also have to have godly protection. Remember, we're supposed to be strong in the Lord and in his strength. And here's how we do it. Verse 14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. That's the first piece of armor. Some translations say the belt of truth. Now, what does the belt do? The belt keeps up everything else, right? Keeps your pants up or keeps your shirt tucked in or whatever the situation is. The belt goes around the center of your body. The truth, the truth of the gospel is the center for everything. It's the truth that Jesus spoke. It's the truth that we believe in. And it's the truth that we share with someone else. It's not a mystery why the first part of this armor happens to be gird your loins or circle your waist or put a belt around you, which is the belt of truth. When we're going forward against the enemy, we need to go forward in truth, not in some kind of fairy tale, not in some kind of half-baked idea. We go forward in the truth, the truth of God's word, his promises, and what Jesus did. We go forward in truth. Now, let me show you this here. Let's, let's do the rest of the verse before I give you some cross-references. It says, stand therefore firm, having girded your loins or tying a belt around your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Soldiers had breastplates. It protected all their vital organs. It was like a, like a shield kind of thing. It was armor so that if someone was trying to pierce them or whatever, it would hit the metal. You're not hitting any vital organs. Well, if you're already going forward with the belt of truth, now you're going forward with the breastplate of righteousness because one of the other things that we must stand against the devil and resist him is living a righteous life, living a life of holiness. But I want to show you, and I told you there'd be some references to Isaiah. If you're writing this down, go back with me to Isaiah 11. If you write it down or come with me in your Bibles. Isaiah 11, verse 5. Now, when we get to Isaiah 11, 
it's talking about Jesus. It's talking about the righteous branch. But I want you to see, because even before Paul was talking about these various things and these various parts of the armor, we find many references to them in the Old Testament. Listen to this. In Isaiah 11, verse 5, it says this, And righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Who is he talking about? Isaiah 11 is talking about the righteous branch. He's talking about Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes, what was he going to have? He was going to have truth. He was going to have righteousness. Notice, it says here, Isaiah 11, 5, And righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. So we're already in good company. As Jesus was going out to do battle against the devil, what did he have? He had righteousness. He had the belt of faith also, the belt of truth, the same way that Paul is encouraging us to have the same thing. We want to follow Jesus. But I want to show you another reference that comes out of verse 14 here, and that is Isaiah 59, 17. Stay with me in Isaiah. Come over to Isaiah 59, verse 17. Once again, we'll see who he's talking about. Isaiah 59, verse 17. Listen to this. He, this is Jesus, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. This was talking about Jesus, what Jesus was going to be doing, because it talks about, in verse 15, the Lord. It talks about the Lord. It was displeasing in his sight. There was no justice. He saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Once again, a picture through the prophet Isaiah of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he came, he came full for battle. He came full in his full armor to deal with the devil and all of those that would follow the devil. You see, if you reject Jesus Christ, you become an enemy of God. Because if you fall in with the world, the Bible says if you're a friend with the world, you're an enemy of God. You're an enmity with God. You're in conflict with God. And so if Jesus is leading us forward and he has the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and so on and all of these other elements we're going to look at, he's the one we need to follow. Let's continue. Let's go back to Galatians or Ephesians 6. Let's look at now. Here's the next thing we need to do. After we have the belt of truth and we have the breastplate of righteousness, the next one in verse 15 says, having shod or or covered your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of peace. When we come to truth, when we come to righteousness, it is a gospel of peace. God brings peace upon our life. Jesus promises in John 14, 27, he says, peace, I leave you. Not as the world leaves you, but as I leave you. I'm leaving you my peace. And so the next thing we have to do as we're marching into this battle is we need to make sure on our feet that we have the preparation of the gospel as we go forward, as we go forward to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, we need to make sure that we are carrying forth the gospel of peace. And to back that up, I'm going to let's stay in, I guess you should keep your thumb there in Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 52. Again, this is another passage, a prophetic passage that was talking about Jesus coming. In Isaiah 52, listen to this, verse 7. How lovely are the mountains and the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation. Who can that be? It can only be one person. It can only be Jesus Christ. And yet we see here in another reference, here was another prophetic reference through the prophet Isaiah that was showing once again when Jesus came, he was going to have yet another part of armor upon his body. The feet of him who bring good news. The good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who announces peace. Peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives you, but as I give you. And who announces salvation. There's salvation in no other name except Jesus Christ. So now we have three parts of the armor so far. And we've seen Jesus clothed in all of them. Wow. Coincidence? No such thing as coincidence. This is prophecy. These are prophecies that were given in the Old Testament. When Jesus came, he went to battle against the devil. And you and I here, 2,000 years after Jesus went back to heaven, we're still in the same battle. And we need to be covered the same way that Jesus was. 
Let's look at item number four, because we now we have the gospel of peace. Verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The evil one, of course, Mr. Devil again. That rotten Satan again. So here's the fourth item. We have what's called a shield of faith. Now, any soldier going into battle had a shield. Sometimes it was like a body shield. Sometimes it was an arm shield. But they had a shield. And as arrows or, or swords or whatever was coming against them, they could deflect it. Or it would get caught in the shield so that they wouldn't be injured. That's the shield of faith. When the devil starts throwing those darts at us, when he starts shooting those arrows at us, when he tries to poison us with bad doctrine or false teachers or false gospels, or he tries to do what he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden and tries to manipulate God's word or tries to deceive us or what he tried to do with Jesus in the wilderness, when he tries his little things, when he's throwing those arrows at you, you can protect it with the shield of faith because the stronger your faith, the more stronger that shield's going to hold up against any attempt of the devil or his cohorts to get you to fall off path, to get you to fall down. We need to keep our shield of faith strong. How do we do that? By reading scripture, by studying scripture, by being around other Christians, by building up our faith. So that when the devil does attack, he cannot have us. He cannot knock us down. We cannot be defeated in battle. It's as simple as that. We cannot be defeated. And so the fourth item we need is the shield of faith to deflect all of those flaming arrows, all those poison darts, all of that terrible stuff that the devil's going to try to do to you. And remember this, the devil will always hit each one of us at our weakest spot. So if you have a weak spot in your life, that's where the devil's going to attack. And that's where you need to shore up your faith and to make sure that that area of your life is well protected. But there's two more that we have to look at here in our last verse tonight in verse 17. And we need to take the helmet of salvation. That's the fifth part. The helmet of salvation. What soldier would go into a battle without a helmet? The helmet protects the most integral part. Yes, the, the breastplate covers the heart and the lungs and all the vital organs. But if you get a head injury, doesn't matter if your heart is still beating or your lungs are still breathing. If you have a head injury, you may have a brain injury and you never recover from. The helmet of salvation. Didn't we see that a little earlier in Isaiah? Well, we were talking about that, about the, the helmet of salvation. Yeah, we saw that. It was in Isaiah 59, 17. Remember? Go back and look up that verse. Jesus is bringing salvation. So as we're going in the battle, we have our shoes covered, the belt around our waist, the breastplate, the shield. Now we have a helmet. There's something missing. See, all of these items are all defensive, aren't they? They stop the enemy. They stop the enemy. The shield does. The breastplate does. The helmet does. But the last part of the armor is offensive, not defensive. It's offensive. You know what it is? It's called the sword of the spirit. Look, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, did you know that? The sword of the spirit is this. It's the word of God. It's the Bible. This is what you take in the battle with you. When the false prophets come against you and the false preachers, when the devil tries to lure you away from your walk with Jesus, when he tries to hit you in your weak spot, what did the psalmist say? Psalm 119, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. When the devil comes against us, we can call up scripture. We can wield that sword of the spirit that cuts both ways. And we're going to look at a reference to that in Hebrews in just a moment. And so as we're going into battle with all of these this defense on us, we are now wielding and yielding the sword of the spirit that's going to pierce people. When we preach to people, when we share the gospel with people, there will be certain people that will hear us. Their hearts will be melted. Their, their, their opposition to God will be taken away. The scales will fall from their eyes. The hardness of the heart will soften. Their minds, their eyes will be open. Their ears will be open. And that is the sword of the Spirit. Let me show you how powerful the Word of God is. Go with me over here to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4 verse 12. This is how powerful our Bible is. This is how powerful the Word of God is. Now listen to this. 
Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joint and marrow. And, get this, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, that is, you want to talk about a verse, there's a verse. The Word of God, first of all, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God is living. And it's active. This is not a dead book that was written thousands of years ago. This is an active book. This is just as active, just as alive, just as potent tonight as it was when it was originally written. Word of God is living. It's a living word. It's an active word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can cut both ways. It says it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit. The word of God will pierce you so deep and convict you. Those that come to truth, how you came to truth and how I came to truth. We had to be broken before God. We had to be contrite before God. We had to tell him, I'm a sinner, Lord. I need salvation. Please come into my life. However that worked for you, whatever your words were. Okay? This is how important and how strong the word of God is. It pierces. It splits, it says, between joint and marrow. Marrow is the inside of a bone. If it can get that deep, it goes to the very core of who we are. It's deeper than anything else. And it's the word of God that can do that. That can do more to, to convict you. And it will do more damage to you than anything else. And if that wasn't enough, look. Now it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God convicts us what we're thinking, what our intentions are what our plans are, if we're living a godly life or not. It convicts us. It changes us. It chastises us when it needs to. If you and I submit to the authority of this book, and this is God's word, and this is our rule book, this is our guidebook, this is how we live our life by what God says. He says we can do it, we do it. He says you don't do it, we don't do it. We live a God-glorifying life. This is the sword of the spirit. This is the most effective weapon of all the armor that's offensive because we're taking this to the people. What I'm doing right now and what you're watching right now, I'm wielding the sword of the spirit. I'm bringing the word of God to you. Some of you may like what you're hearing, may be blessed by what I'm saying. Others may not. You may have turned me off already for all I know. You may have changed the channel. You're back doing something else. Well, the word of God is going to pierce you when it's ready to pierce you, when you are ready to accept the word of God. And that, very briefly, within 20 minutes or so, is what the full armor of God is. There are six elements. Let's go over them very quickly before I say goodbye. What are the six elements? And could you rattle them off without having to look at your notes? <laughs> Let's go back here and make sure we have everything right. Ephesians chapter 6. What do we have here? Six pieces. Whoop. Nothing like having the fan on here and blowing your pages all over the place. Here we go. Here's your six things. Gird your loins or tie around your waist the belt of truth. Two, the breastplate of righteousness. Three, have your feet covered with the gospel of peace, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Four, have your shield of faith. Five, have your helmet of salvation. Six, have the sword of the spirit that you go forward into battle with. It's the most effective weapon you will ever have, the word of God. I pray that this brief study has helped you. If it has, please feel free to share it. God said in Isaiah, Good old Isaiah, 5511, he said that his word will not return void. It will reach everybody it needs to reach. If it reached you tonight as you're watching this, or you're watching a replay and this has reached you, then it was meant for you. And all I ask is that you take it and share it with someone else because this is God's word going forward. We need to reach everyone. Do our part in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Because even in the span of this broadcast, people have died. Many of them lost forever because they left this world without jesus do your part i'm doing my part let's share this word of god second of all i told you at the beginning be a berean acts 17 11. 
you may get tired of me saying this, but I'm not going to stop. The Bereans were more noble than other people. Why? Did they have more advantage economically? No. Were they nicer looking? I don't know. What they did was two things. They accepted the word with readiness of heart. They were ready to hear the word. They were ready to hear Paul preach. But then they turned around and they searched the scriptures every single day to make sure what they were hearing was true. You need to do the same thing. Take every passage, every, every verse that I gave you tonight and examine them, study them in the light of the whole Bible and make sure what you heard was the truth. You owe it to yourself to be a Berean. You don't accept just what I'm saying point blank because you like my style or what I'm saying or whatever. Anybody you're watching on television, listening to on radio, a church you may go to, a Bible study you belong to, a church group that you visit, and especially, especially here on social media. This place out here, this social media is something else. Everybody and his brother is preaching, but a lot of it is not very good. A lot of it is not biblical. And yes, I'm saying it. You need to decide what is truth and what is not truth based on your own study of Scripture. So be a Berean, Acts 17, 11. Lastly, would you pray for this ministry? As I said earlier, we, are got, we have the full armor of God on and we're in a war. We're in a battle every single day, every day, every day, because we're not backing down. We're not retreating. We're on the front lines and we need your prayers. Please pray for this ministry, livinginharmonyministries.org. If you want to go and see our website, that's where you find us, livinginharmonyministries.org. Please keep us in prayer as we are praying for you. We're here for you. If you have a prayer request, you can get in touch with us through the website. Some of you already contact me through Facebook, uh, Twitter, these various accounts that I'm on. I'm around. I'm available all the time for counsel. If you need help with something, if you just have a prayer request, I want to be able to minister to you. And if God would lead you to support our ministry, we would be grateful for that. I'm not a big money person, but let's face it. We need money to survive. We Ministries need money to do what we need to do, whether we're traveling to, to local churches and preaching which I'm going to be doing two more times this month of July, or we're going uh, in different areas or whatever God has called us to do, it costs money. And so would you please pray about supporting us? If that's something that God lays on your heart, you can do it right through our website at livinginharmonyministries.org, or you can do it right through Facebook Messenger. It's quick, it's easy, it's secure, it takes less than a minute, and it's done. But I leave that to you and God. That's all I'm going to say about it. That's between you and God. Thank you for being with me for our Thursday message. God bless you.